Congratulations on the film. It premieres tonight. Um, we're here in conversation with the director, screenwriter, and stars of Sharp Stick. Lena, I guess, yeah, I loved Tiny Furniture, and I've been waiting for your return to filmmaking. Obviously, you've been store, you know, doing lots of things in between, but how did it feel returning to the, the film format? It was really beautiful. I mean, I think that sometimes we want to say, I've worked in television, obviously, for a long time, 10 years, and um, I think we often want to say that film and television are, like, interchangeable mediums, and it's not that television isn't an incredibly beautiful, valid art form, but it's a different art form. And so, I, I mean, it's all storytelling, but it's a different art form. And and I love TV, but movies are what made me want to start doing this. And so it's just, it's a medium that sort of is so embedded in my imagination and my subconscious. And, and this movie in a way is such an ode to so many of the movies that so many of the films of the 70s that I watched that really formed my sense of sort of like adult movies, real movies, and um, just trying to turn certain certain tropes on their head. And then I feel so lucky to to work with this amazing cast who made um, who made Diving Back In such a pleasure. What were some of those influences? El Du Jour, To A Woman Under the Influence, To Wanda by Barbara Loden. A lot of those movies from the 70s, as amazing as the parts where women are, they're seen through a pretty male lens. And so this was about trying to ask some of those same questions about sexuality and complicated characters, but try to really do it from a very specific perspective of having been a person who's who's only lived as female in this lifetime, as Taylor would say. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful cast, brilliant actors. Anyone can answer this, but I'm curious, you know, from the script stage, what, what it initially uh, pulled you to the project and what made you know you wanted to work on this film? First and foremost, just like Lena being attached to it and being the one who created it. I mean, like I'm down, like I wanted to work with her. I wanted to work for, with her since Tiny Furniture, since Girls, like she's always been someone who I've deeply admired and also just as a human being and how courageous she is and how she speaks up about things that I think we, a lot of us can relate to and things that we go through. She's vulnerable in that space. And then, so doing it with a project like this, which, you know, is, um, a vulnerable one. Um, I wouldn't want to do it with anyone else, like her guiding the way and her being there. Um, yeah, leading us on this journey, like with, with with the themes of like sexual awakening and 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 um and just coming to your own. There was just there just wasn't a better duo for that. Like I, so, I just fell in love with Sarah Jo right away. I really wanted to be a part of sharing her story. Also, to Christine's point, the same thing. I. Lena came to me and um, was really consistent and kind and said that she wrote this character for me. And I was like, I don't know if I, I felt we naturally, I feel like every actor gets scared to play a new part. And you're like, okay, you thought I was cool in something. I don't know if I can do that again, you know? And like, she just was like, I, like I will tailor it will you know will whatever and you're thankful to for people that are calling you and are like interested in you and they're interesting because they're interested and also it was the pandemic I hadn't worked in like a year and something and just to be presented with something that was different than the last thing I did is also a dream like that's I just want to have a colorful life colorful career expand grow try be bad be good whatever John, what, what drew you to the, the part? It's quite a departure for you in some ways. Since meeting um, Lena, it's just sort of been this uh, kind of like series of, of, of explosive, you know, like bits of joy, honestly. I, I think you meet heroes, people that you admire, people that you're enormous fans of, and it can kind of go one of two ways when you start to get them to know them as a human being. I, I think the same is true when you read a script that you really dig. Then you start to meet the people. You start to meet the people that you're going to work with. Um, you start to get to know the culture of the set and how the, the, the work is actually going to be sort of approached. And again, it can kind of go in one of two ways. Everything with Lena and everything about this process, I know I can speak for, for, for everyone involved, was just only, it just only got better, more inspiring, uh, taking bigger risks, uh, feel, feeling better, feeling safer. Um, so yeah, you know, that this one was an absolute no brainer because I wanted to work with her so much. And then it just, um, I, I, I'm, I'm super, super glad that I didn't it just ended up just being a, a total, total joy. Lena, how do you go about uh, creating a, you know, an atmosphere in which talent feels, you know, comfortable to explore the, you know, sex, sexuality and its portrayals? 
I think that something that's really important is just making sure that you understand how each person wants to feel safe because each person's language of safety is different. And um, one thing that was really wonderful was is that now we have intimacy coordinators and that's someone whose job it is to understand how someone would feel most comfortable going about a sex scene, what it is that they need. But I think that that can extend to any scene, which is that you just have to get to know um, the language uh, that makes an actor most comfortable. And I always appreciate it when people get to know what makes me feel safe. And so I try to do the same thing for other people. And what was great was each of these actors is so communicative, so clear, and so loving that you can't help but, you know, take on board what their specific, um, what their specific way of working is. And I learned so much from each of their way of working. And then also there's the added layer now of wanting to make sure people feel um, safe in COVID. So gotta cap shout out Troy, our COVID compliance officer, um, who every single weekend would just say, make good choices. Probably good for us all to remember. Absolutely. Uh, I hear Troy's words in my head every Friday. Christine, you mentioned, you know, just knowing Lena was in, was uh, at the helm made you feel more comfortable in taking on this kind of role. What what specifically, you know, throughout the process, I'm curious, you know, in the actual work um, made you feel comfortable, you know, on a day to day? To begin with, just just the con- the first conversation we ever had, she just created the space where I could just be honest and we could just like talk to each other just as two human beings about what we're afraid of and what our fears of and what I was, you know, at the time exploring within myself and what I wanted to, you know, what my fears were. And, and then she would just receive it and listen to it and and take it. And so on the day, I mean, all those things were there. She had, you know, she'd heard me about what I was fearful of. And, and uh, therefore I just, you know, on the day it was all sorted. We'd done all the work beforehand. So on the day we could just actually play with things that we had choreographed and be, you know, in the characters and, and be in the scenes. So it was all, you know, the conversations beforehand that just made me feel so heard and safe. I'm curious, Lena, you opened saying that, you know, you wanted to flip sort of tropes on their heads. What are some of your like least favorite, you know, representations or things that sort of male filmmakers and the male gaze have sort of done over the years? Of course, there are many, many amazing female characters created by male filmmakers and some of my favorite, most inspiring female characters, but there's definitely a tendency um, in um, movies about women by men to give them a sort of like very specific trauma origin story. Like, um, Christine's character, Sarah Jo, does have some trauma in her background, but it doesn't define her and it doesn't um, doesn't explain away all of her sexual behavior. There's a tendency to try to like renew someone with the love of a good man at the end, which is another least favorite of mine. Mm-hmm. And then also a tendency to either make either for a filmmaker to make either women or men to sort of like express their own discomfort with the opposite sex by either making the woman or the man just plainly good or plainly bad. And something I loved about all these actors and particularly John was so amazing about this is people being comfortable playing people who are multifaceted Mm -hmm. and who don't have a, who aren't clear heroes or villains. And I really love um, the opportunity to explore that that middle space. Um, And I think the idea of unlikability is something that I've always wanted to push back against because I don't find anyone unlikable. Um, I just find people fascinating. Yeah, you've come to define sort of depictions of sexuality on screen, this sort of unlikable woman thing, all these things that, you know, I think are very like valid, you know, things that we want to push against and that we love seeing, you know, different representations of. And then you sort of become synonymous with that thing, right? It's like, it becomes what your work is about yeah. when those were just things you were interested in, you know, in addition to many other things. Yeah. That, that's really well said. And also like, I don't think anyone should be synonymous with defining sexuality on screen because sexuality is, and I never set out to be the voice of female sexuality because female sexuality, just like human sexuality is as multi-layered as people are, and there are as many versions of it as there are human beings on this earth. And I think we're learning that more and more as our culture comes to be more open about gender and that being a spectrum and sexuality being something that doesn't sort of have these um, sort of like preordained twists and turns, but that is really, really personal for people and changes as they change. And so my thing is, I just wanna see lots of people exploring these topics in the way that feels right to them. And my hope is always just more voices talking about, talking about these things. Um, And because I think 
people's personal perspective on per, people publicly sharing their personal perspective on really private issues is what gets me excited. Taylor, you seemed like you want to chime in there. I mean, Zola obviously was also such an incredible um, exploration of women's sexuality and and pleasure. Um, what are some things that you you know you'd like to see more of on screen, and some things that you're ready to retire for good? <laughs> That's so, I mean, that's an amazing question. I have so much to say and then also don't even know what to say. I, I hope to, I just think that like the infinite possibility of movie making and storytelling is like, it's, it's like possibility. It's like a window to possibility. It's like what is and what could be. And so I just hope we continue to like, I don't know, in a way I'm like, nothing's new. Like people were getting down and exploring shit and being weird in the 1900s, in the 1700s, like none of this is new. None of these social, I mean, we've just been like pretty shitty toward each other the whole time, but like who we've been and our curiosity and our weirdness or queerness, if you will, is a part of like our spirit. It's a part of how we grow. It's like, we're in these bodies and we're just like, hello, oh, this makes sense. And I just hope like, we can tell more stories that make people feel like, oh my God, I'm not that strange. No, you're just human, like with no context, trying to make sense of it. And hopefully you feel a little bit less alone. And I love that the landscape of filmmaking doesn't have to be like what it used to be, but I hope we can be more open to the various ways of being. Very well said. I hope so too. Lena, what have you learned about the collaborative process of filmmaking during the pandemic and how have you kept the creative spirit alive during these times? Oh God, what question? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, well, a lot of it I've learned from these people on this uh, Zoom right here. Just the fact that we all came together at a time when LA was, you know, entering into another lockdown. It was around Christmas 2020 when, you know, just being in another a room with other people was a little bit scary and everyone came and we had people there whose job was to keep us safe and everybody was respectful of them and respectful for, to each other and brought everything to this. And, you know, John, Christine and Taylor have become great teachers in my life, creatively, emotionally. Um, and I really carried that with me as I went into other projects in the pandemic, as I kept writing. Um, and it was definitely something I look back on a lot when, if I had a moment where my spirit was flagging. John, what's your advice to your younger self when you were just starting out? What do you wish you would have known? I want to know this. Yeah, same. <laughs> same! Oh, Help man. us, John. <laughs> oh, man. Advice to my younger self. I don't know. You know, like every instinct in that question makes me want to say, you know, um, you know, don't, 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 don't fight so hard. Don't, 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 don't. Don't take it so seriously, but I, I, I know I, you have you. I don't want to say that. I think you have to. I, I, I like go through it, man. Just like go through it. Stop. Just, just go through it. When things, uh, I think, just like in life in general, and and in this work, makes sense. It's, it's always under the uh, under the umbrella of worry about. Don't worry about trying to get into the room, but just worry about what you're gonna do when you get in there. Like stay in the lab, like stay growing, stay hungry, stay scared, stay, stay, stay fierce, like stay, stay in that element. Don't, don't, don't try to, you know, play the games or try to, you know, meet the right people or work like just we're animals, be an animal, you know? Wow. Oh, I feel jazzed up already. That's I know. He's really jazzing of a, he's a jazzing person. Yeah, I haven't seen the film yet, but um, I know the character is a 26 year old virgin. I mean, I don't know if that's your language, but that's how, you know, it's been written about, you know, there's all these articles now that like Gen Z's having less sex and we're all having less sex. Why did you decide to like make the character a virgin, quote unquote, you know, whatever that means? I mean, I was just really interested in the idea. I don't, I don't know anything about the kind of sex Gen Z's having, but um, I'm an old married person. I would not know anything about that, Jude. But um, <laughs> uh, I liked the idea of a character who had lived, but hadn't lived that and what that would do to them. And there was almost a little bit of a Cinderella thing. She lives at home with her mom and her sister. They kind of see her as this one dimensional caretaking in this one dimensional caretaking role. And then she has this entire secret life, much like the girl who gets to go to the ball in the glass slipper when nobody's, you know, looking and then scurry back to her home. And so 
that was just a really felt like it was like really fertile for exploration. And then, um, and then obviously what I loved is that, you know, John, his character, Josh is the person that she loses her virginity to. And he brought so much like wisdom and sensitivity to who the guy would be, who would take on that role um, and what that dynamic looked like between them. And Christine and I had so many conversations and it was just, it was a um, very organic process finding that dynamic. And then um, Taylor's character, Trina, she has a much more sort of outward and projected sexuality, but her actual private life around her sexuality may be in some ways more tortured. And that was an interesting contrast to me, the person who projects sexuality, but actually feels, doesn't feel yeah. it. <laughs> and yeah. The person who's like, terrified versus the person who projects this sort of innocence, but is actually sort of feral inside and what that looks like. I mean, in some ways, movies have been doing that for a long time, right? Projecting sexuality and not actually feeling it. Um, that's beautifully said. And in a lot of ways, movies have tried to divide women into like sexual being women who enjoy sex and get murdered and women who don't enjoy <laughs> sex and get to live to the end of the movie. And it's just right. trying to play with all of that. And then also inhabit the male characters too that was the goal yeah john where where do the male characters fit in in all this and what do you hope to sort of you know what do you think is annoying when you're when you're watching a film you know and you see it a sex scene or something and what do you hope to see more of because it just is sort of lena's way uh i i love the opportunity to to to, to play this part um and 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 to explore this guy's nervousness and and humiliation and and dissatisfaction and and uh his own trepidation about his own sexuality and i think so much of the lens that we're sort of fed you know sexuality in movies it is it's this male lens of like you've gotta you've gotta it's all about what do i want how can i how, how can i be pleased and um I, I, I think that there was a real, what I love, what we found with this guy is that there was a real thing of, um, wait, you, you, you're looking, you're looking at me. Why me? Why, what, what is, I, I, I can't, I, I, you're, you're great. I'm not. I, I think it would have been so easy to, to, in lesser hands than Lena's, it would have been really easy to approach this role as sort of swarthy and and manipulative and really um like kind of sinister in a way and it can have all of that but i think behind it is this nuance of 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 um there's a real uh there's a real innocence to it a real purity to it and um i was grateful for that i think it's really important to divorce ourselves from judgment good and bad when, yeah. when when we're dealing with these sexual issues and i think everyone's nervous men women and everyone is unsure i love being in 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 lena's hands and specifically sorry to go on so long but i just i've said this before but i think you know lena being sort of the champion that she is and the hero that she is and this this like just just unbelievable hero of of of, of feminism i think she has done such a service in the way that she writes men because i think the men that she creates are so nuanced and complicated and she puts them in the most complicated situations and um that's just how art needs to be i think it just it it, it needs to it needs to be rich and complicated and not black or white and so I, you know su super grateful to to be able to go into this realm with, with with these folks i feel really lucky and i've dealt before with actors actually particularly male actors who are actually more concerned about being likable often than their female counterparts. Like it really matters to them that people root for their character or see them. And it's interesting because John doesn't go into it with any preconceptions like that, but in the process makes you root for him just because he's only thinking about the authentic inner life of the character. And that makes you root for him. I was talking to John Cameron Mitchell the other day about um, his film short bus just got uh, restored. And, you know, there's like live sex in that movie and um he was basically saying that like porn owns on-screen sex and you know that film needs to kind of catch up what do you think porn has sort of what what does it have to say about sort of screen depictions of sexuality and where do you think ours you know our contemporary life is sort of mimicking it I, I know there's some exploration of that in this film or you know well, it's really important to me that this film not have anything prescriptive or negative to say about porn. Like this isn't the film that takes the Andrea Jorkin perspective that porn is, you know, is the problem in our society. Actually, one of the great 
lovely characters of this movie who really give Sarah Jo like a sense that she's worth something happens to be her favorite porn star played by Scott Speedman and and showing the role that porn can actually play in like a healthy sexual development and um I think that's really important to look at it was really essential to me that the movie be um sex positive and positive about those jobs because like any job there's a version of it that's unsafe but also but that's the same with being an actor and that's the same with being a firefighter and that's the same with being you know a teacher and so um I think we really wanted to just um you know paint that with a lot of nuance that was important to me um I'm a huge I know everyone loves girls but I am a huge delusional downtown divas fan Oh my God, you just blew my mind open. That's like a web series I made when I was like 20 that is deranged, you guys. So Jude has just incredible. Really brought the memories back. Thank you. I mean, that was talk about the early wave of, I mean, you were doing that before anyone was, you know, before I, I made like, Mom, I'm doing this thing. You may not have heard of it. It's called a web series and it's the future. And she was like, good luck with that. They may not have taken off. Web series didn't become the future in the way we thought they would be. But insofar that now every series is a web series. Any plans to ever revisit, if not those characters, but like, you know, some sort of art world satire, I think is very I right. Know. I mean, I think having been raised in the art world, it's definitely a world that I really enjoy skewering, but also trying to do it in a way that's different than the typical, like, I don't like to make fun of modern art and say a kid could do this because I actually don't think a kid could do it, but I love the world of, the, the art world's just so rich with characters and I love characters and I grew up around pure characters and a lot of the people I grew up around were in that first web series I did. And, you know, the two other women who were in the series with me, Joanna and Isabel, are still two of my best friends. And they're not actors. One's an illustrator. One's a ceramicist. They both have kids. I maybe will do like an age 40, get the gang back together webisode. That could be exciting. I would love that. I think I think we're ready for it. Thank you for being the first person ever to ask me about a delusional downtown divas reunion and not a girls reunion. That means oh, a lot. <laughs> I'll take that with me. Um, I'll let you guys go. I know you, you have your actual virtual premiere to get ready for. It's been such a pleasure. Congratulations. Thank you. Love you all. So nice to meet you, Jude. Give Buzz my love. I will. Thanks, Lena.